Maybe the most influential and important distinction that Kant draws talking about the philosophy of art and the nature of beauty is in his discussion, and you'll read about it in the textbook section, the distinction between pure and impure beauty. This overlaps in interesting ways with his discussion of free beauty. So Kant uses the word free beauty and pure beauty in ways that are not entirely consistent. I'm going to discuss these concepts together, and for us, pure and free beauty will not be distinguished from each other. Okay, so what is pure or free beauty for Kant? Let's start with a definition. Pure or free beauty is non-conceptual, instead it's perceptual beauty that art possesses, and we can find that beauty without looking at what the art represents, and finding that beauty is separate from the emotional reactions, tastes, or desires we have. Kant says that pure or free beauty is something that we can find with disinterestedness. Kant does give us right away an example of this. So he says, consider something like a flower. For most people, the beauty of a flower is just the beauty of the way a flower looks to us. Looking at the way a beautiful flower presents itself to our senses, you'll get a feeling of satisfiedness, a feeling of beauty that is pure beauty. Now to contrast the free or pure beauty that a flower might give you, Kant says at least sometimes we look at flowers not for their free or pure beauty, but sometimes we would appreciate, let's say, a picture of a flower because it represents a flower. So I might look at a picture of a flower and say, that's a beautiful picture. And if someone asked me why, I would just say, it has beautiful colors arranged in a beautiful way that a sensitive person would realize is a beautiful representation. That is something like what Khan is getting at with pure beauty. It's just when it, you observe it with your senses in an open and disinterested way, you see a beautiful representation to your senses. Now Kant says there is at least one other way we could look at the beauty of a flower, and he imagines that, for example, a scientist, a botanist, might look at the beauty of a flower and say, that's a beautiful flower, by which I mean something like, this is a great flower for um, reflecting bright light so that a bee could find it, so that the bee could pollinate the flower and make more flowers. It's beautiful as a representation of a flower. So sometimes we only appreciate and find that flower beautiful because of what it represents. For example, it represents a way for a flower to make seeds, which then creates more plants and more flowers. But I also might look at a flower to appreciate it in a way that was beyond purely perceptual appreciation as well. If I thought about the symbolic representation of a flower, uh, yellow flowers represent something like uh, sympathy or friendship. Or Kant uses this same distinction in reference to how we might appreciate a piece of music. Imagine something like Mozart's G minor symphony. Mozart is often appreciated for the structure and beauty of his works and just the ways in which the sounds strike us as we appreciate a beautiful composition. There's a sort of mathematical and structural beauty that we can appreciate without thinking about who Mozart was or what Mozart's G minor symphony might represent. We can just appreciate the sensory experience of taking in the music through our perceptual system. One way Kant puts this is to say that free beauty strikes us as purposeful or meaningful, even though no purpose is given to the work. So let's talk a little bit about what impure or dependent beauty is. Impure or dependent beauty is beauty that's dependent on the concept of what the art represents 
in order to find that beauty. This painting by Thomas Cole is part of a series of paintings that are designed to show what human life is like as we move from childhood into adulthood and then old age. And this landscape is impossible to really understand or experience without thinking about it representationally. You see this person here floating down a river. Since it's called Voyage of Life Manhood, we know already that it's not just meant to be an image with interestingly contrasting light and dark areas, but these light and dark areas probably represent light and dark parts of life. The dark stream and the white water that awaits the human likely represent the toils of life, and the light at the end likely represents a reward at the end for us. The clouds faintly depict heavenly beings and malevolent beings that seem to be influencing the scene and encouraging our voyager here to make good choices and live as a good person. With a work of art like this, if we appreciate it at all, it's likely that we'll find the appreciation by thinking about the ways in which the representational content, not just of a person on a river, which is itself representational, but the way in which the person on the river represents what human life is like in general. So if we found beauty in a work of art like this, so if we found beauty in a work of art like this, Kant would say this is another kind of beauty, but it's not a purely sensory beauty, it's a dependent beauty. It's impure just in that it isn't purely sensory. And this aspect of the beauty comes from harmonizing the idea of the painting with the methods and appearance of the work. Of course, it would be possible to appreciate this painting as well, simply as a form of pure beauty. If you could forget it represents anything at all and just see it as a contrast of light and dark shapes in a way that's beautiful to the senses Forget it depicts a person, forget it depicts a river, forget it depicts clouds, and forget it has this intense symbolic meaning related to Thomas Cole's ideas about what life is like. In fact, you might even find all of the allegorical and symbolic aspects of Thomas Cole's painting to be pedestrian or somewhat disturbing and still appreciate it just for the interplay of colors and shapes as we observe it with our eyes. Kant points out in the reading that depictions of human beings are especially difficult, if not impossible, to represent for their pure beauty, to represent as things that are just beautiful for the play of shapes and colors on our senses. Because when we see a human form, it's only natural to take that human form as the form of a human, not just a series of shapes, which might be beautiful as abstract shapes in themselves. For something like Michelangelo's David, this might be doubly difficult because Michelangelo's David represents not just Michelangelo's version of what an idealized figure of a young man might look like. It's also thought to represent the Florentine city-state itself, as exemplified by the small but brave figure, which was David defending his people against threats from outsiders. We can also think of this dependent or impure beauty in something like a work of music. Beethoven, in contrast to Bach, is a composer who's often appreciated for the representational qualities of his musical works. For example, here in his sixth pastoral, here Beethoven means to represent the approach of a powerful storm that starts with some 
light rain streaking from the sky, followed by flashes of lightning, followed by intense rain and thunder. It's difficult to imagine appreciating this work by Beethoven without also thinking about what it represents, which is, at a minimum, a physical storm. It's not just a sequence of sounds that is beautiful in and of itself as beautiful sounds in relation to each other. Instead, much of the experience comes from the harmony that the sounds have with the idea of the experience of a storm. Now, the way we're talking about pure and impure beauty almost seems to suggest that impure beauty is something like a dirty or a bad thing. And that is not what Kant wants to suggest. He's not saying that impure beauty comes from impure thoughts or it's polluted by something bad. He's not saying that we should never say something is beautiful because of the concept behind it or the way the artistic representation relates to that concept. Both kinds of beauty are important, but it's clear as you read Kant's description that what he considers the truly artistic capability is that genius which creates perceptual beauty as we perceive the work of art. So just as a reminder, Purely sensory beauty is independent of what it represents. This is free or pure beauty. And if we're looking at the dependent beauty, we're looking at the thing that is represented by the art and how it's represented. Now we can return to this question that we started with when we were talking about Kant. That free beauty, that pure beauty, that perceptual beauty is a product of the human mind. Things are beautiful just because that's what appeals to or pleases the human mind when it looks at the world without conceptual expectations, without its own emotional response, just being open to the perceptual beauty of the thing. On the other hand, this free or pure beauty is not subjective in another way. Kant believes that everyone who can, in a disinterested way, look at something and appreciate it just as a perceptual experience without thinking about its meaning or your own desire or your own emotional response. Everyone with that capacity should be able to see the perceptual beauty that a thing has, subjective, because pure beauty relies on the human mind, objective, because all human perceptual systems, according to Kant, are basically the same, unless something has gone wrong with your ability to perceive. So we see that for Kant, good art is a matter of Yes, following traditional rules that govern how art is made, you have to learn all that stuff. But what makes something truly beautiful as it relates to pure beauty is that the artist is able to create the art in such a way that it pleases our senses in a way that cannot be fully explained with concepts. Good art can serve as a model for more good art And good art can have that impure beauty as well, which shows a unity between the idea of what is represented and the method used to represent that thing. In our next module, we'll look at Hegel, who also believes that the world we experience is a product of how mind generates a world for us to experience. But where Kant was especially interested in that purely perceptual beauty, Hegel is much more interested in the conceptual 
beauty and in the ways in which art can help us think about the nature of our world, the nature of ourselves, and it can evolve us as human beings to create a society that's more free, equal, self-aware, and rational. We'll talk about Hegel next time.